My name is Dustin Kelly, but everybody calls me DJ. I'm prior Army, serving as both a Ford Observer and a military police officer. I spent the last 14 and a half years as a police officer and detective in a large metropolitan police department. Two things that I've learned throughout my career. One, everybody has a story to tell. And two, the best stories are true. This is the DTD Podcast. In three, two, one, and we're live. Hey guys, welcome back to the DTD Podcast. This is going to be a special episode. Uh, my friend Tilt has come into town talking to a bunch of people. My friend Greg has joined him. Everyone knows without introduction, but we'll go ahead and do it anyway. John Stryker Meyer, former Mac V SOG in the Secret War in Vietnam, and my buddy, former captain in the Green Berets during the Global War on Terror. Greg Walker. I'm so glad that you guys are in here. And the reason I wanted to bring you in was while I had everyone together, I wanted to do kind of a cross-generational talk about the similarities, the differences, and kind of how we feel, how the world has ended up, and if we've made it better or worse, or how we get to it. So it's going to be deep in in discussion today. So Tilda, I want to start with you. We all know your backstory. You've been on the episodes before. Greg, we know your backstory. So what I want to go into directly is when you decide to go into the Green Berets, you guys come in at different times. What was it about them that stuck out to you so much that made you want to join not only the Green Berets, but the secret war in Vietnam? And then, of course, after he's done, Greg, what made you join while you did? Because you were prior enlisted, went to West Point, and then went over. So... Let's start with you, Tilt. Well, yeah, the uh, the secret war part was just an unknown factor. So going through training group near the end, when you got to know your instructors a little bit, they said, when you get to Vietnam, you know, go to an A camp, you're young, learn how Vietnam works, hang out with these Green Berets that are in their A camps. They said, but stay away from the projects. There's a lot of guys are dying. What are the projects? Well, we can't really say, but, you know, and then one guy told us, when you get there, you have your in-country training. When you're done, somebody's going to come out and ask for volunteers. Don't volunteer. Just get assigned to an A-camp. So <laughs> in my case, I flunked out of college. I read the book, The Green Berets, and I was just a city slicker from Trenton, New Jersey. And that book just hit home with me. The unconventional warfare, the characters that were in there, they were all intelligent, really sharp, thought outside the box, and they were dedicated to a mission. The interesting thing about that with you, and it always has been when I've talked to you and we talk a lot on the phone with each other, you always kind of want to go against the grain a little bit just to kind of show people <laughs> when they tell you, hey, don't apply to that stuff. You're like, oh, really? I'm going to go ahead and do it. It's a little it. part of my anti establishmentarian <laughs> mentality. And, and that's what's <laughs> always interesting is that you wanted to be a Green Beret, but there were Green Berets telling you, hey, don't be part of these projects and everything. And you were like, you know what? I want to check those out. And, and when that, you look back on it now, is there anything different that you would have done maybe not gone to it or that was the best decision you made how how did that work out for you no i would have done it the same way i mean um everything was new for me the war was expanding at the time and it was 68 which was the worst year in terms of our casualties both in the secret war and in the vietnam war because of the tet offensive and um we had a mission which was that fighting the communists there and um so no i would have done it the same way uh, maybe we could have learned a couple more lessons to be a little bit better in land navigation. <laughs> uh, you know, in, in these past couple of days that we've been recording in the studio, I've heard more than one person say that they wish they were better at land navigation. At, at one point, they even said they, they circled around and hit the same spot a couple of times right. while in country oh, sure. before they figured out, hey, I don't think we're on the right route. Well, thankfully for Special Forces training, it's teamwork. And I always found somebody from Texas. <laughs> who know how to get who to get around and that saved my ass. <laughs> All right, Greg, to you. Different era, global war on terror, still though, a very big turning point in not only American history, but in world history. What made you decide to do that after all of your stuff, as we talked about West Point, being a medic before that? What made you decide to be a Green Beret? It's funny you ask. Ultimately I didn't want to be. Like I remember going through Ranger School and telling myself I'm not doing this again. Um, but I remember, 
I remember applying because I was on a mortar PL or a mortar team. So I was a mortar PL and we had a small team. I loved that environment where I knew everyone well. I was going on missions with everyone. It's really well involved. And so that's really what led me towards SF and applying. And that what validated that for me was my first deployment. There was an SF team in RAO, 3314, and they were doing some great stuff. Awesome team. I actually happened uh, to have an opportunity to go out there for a couple weeks and integrate with them. Uh, help with some of their mortar fires and just um, try to build that, I don't want to say esprit de corps, but that uh, collaborative effort since we were in the same battle space. Um, and just seeing how they functioned. Everybody was very driven. Everybody was very intelligent. That was absolutely something I wanted to be a part of. And so that's where that to me was very validating. Uh, I wanted to be on a small team of guys that were driven, competent, and cared about each other. That was a selling point for me. Same for you about the small teams, the the camaraderie, same thoughts for you in Vietnam? Absolutely, because with the book, you write about the A-teams where you had a, a team captain and who had his A-team, but the enlisted men were, were the backbone. And they really got it, and it's just like, wow, what these guys could do with a small unit working with local people to help them defend themselves. That's it, that's a cat's meow. I didn't want to, really want to be part of the big army and it just seems so attractive, you know? Yeah, absolutely. The training that you actually received before you went in country, before you started deployments. Now, of course, you had deployed before you were a Green Beret. But the training, I want you to kind of talking back and forth with each other in this next section about the training, what it, how it was the same, how it was different, because I would like to see over that stretch and that cross-generational, if they kept those same core values, that same core teaching, in order to turn out the Green Berets of the future. Let's start with you in Vietnam and the training because you did a lot of training plus in-country training before you actually headed out on missions. Yes, absolutely. And uh, we had our, when we arrived in Vietnam, we had three weeks of in-country training. So you learned everything from working TAC air, using a lot of experimental helicopters. So you had to use to get familiar with each one. Although we never worked with the South Vietnamese Air Force. And uh, that would be part of the culture shock later on. And um, then after three weeks, then you're getting ready for your assignment. And that's when the uh, little guy comes out and says, we're looking for volunteers. And even then, we weren't really clear about what it was. We had rumors and scuttlebutt. And uh, so the training we had in country was for more conventional type stuff. Like one example is if you're on patrol and you get ambushed, you attack the ambush. Well, on our recon teams, if we got ambushed, we had the whole drill of pulling back. There's a there's a term, I think it's the Australian uh, rollback, is it? I've heard Anyways, of the Australian peel, too. Peel, that's what yeah. it is. Thank you. But it's basically you have contact be pulled back from it so you could, because you don't know with the jungle, if there's 10 or 30 people there with a six-man recon team. Right. So that's one major tactical difference that we picked up as soon as we got began training with the recon teams. And I, I've heard you talk, you know, before with other guests of yours, and you talked about the training of listening to your indige that you had with you, and they would teach you listening to the jungle, listening to the surroundings around you, that it would, if you didn't hear it come back on after you guys went silent, something was out there, and to really pay attention to your surroundings. You with indigenous people, same kind of training. Uh, was it different working with indigenous? Because I've never heard you say a bad thing. I have, on the other hand, heard some people say that there were problems with indigenous forces. Would you agree you never really had a problem with uh, indigenous forces? We were blessed. Our team and several other guys that had teams with the local people, the Montagnards or Nungs. Mine was all South Vietnamese. Greg? My SF experience with uh, the indigenous partners we worked with was exceptional. In the conventional army, it was not. Like uh, my first deployment, we worked with an Afghanistan organization. They had a lot of problems with discipline. Um, I still remember being on a mortar position. Uh, five feet from me was an Afghan strung out on opium because we'd be walking through poppy fields. Uh, that was not a great relationship or very beneficial. <laughs> but the, uh, the stuff we did in Africa, the interpreters we worked with, um, very much the tilt's point, they, they could expose us to things that we'd have never had been able to discover on our own. Uh, they were exceptionally beneficial. So I would say that was a very good relationship overall, very beneficial. And that's something that we've carried through. SF does continue to work with indigenous. We do, what's one of the things I like about SF as far as the special operations community, 
we highly prioritize building those relationships in a genuine way in order to better facilitate what we're both trying to do there. So yeah, that's why we do language. That's why we do all these things. How important, and, and it's a pretty basic question, and I know the answer to it, but how <clears throat> important is indigenous personnel to not only winning the war, but winning the big buzzword, the hearts and minds of the people around you? Let's start with you, Tilt. Well, because our missions were out of the country, there wasn't a whole lot of hearts and minds in the villages and stuff. But whenever we go down for training, we'd always be, you know, always be conscious of doing things to the villagers that would do nothing to alienate them, to befriend them, always had extra candy for the kids, treats, whatever, and, and hand it out. And um, uh, again, with the South Vietnamese, like for our indigenous people, you know, in my case, I had to earn their respect. Yeah. <laughs> because, you know, there's, a, there's that famous yeah. line from Sal, who was the Vietnamese counterpart. He turned to the interpreter when we met in May. He goes, he's too tall, his feet are too big, and he looks stupid. Yeah. <laughs> so I had to, had to come back and earn earn Sal's respect, and it took a while. Well, and, and when you say that, though, that you had to earn their respect, it almost kind of puts everything on its head because you're over there helping fight to – you know, free the oppressed over there, but you're still earning their respect to work with you. Did that ever feel strange to you? Did it ever feel like, man, we're working really hard for these guys and it's really hard to earn their respect? No, that, I, that thanks to the SF training again, it's like, okay, this is the, this is the way this is going to work. And we're working with the locals. They're, this is their war. We're here to help them. And the secret war was, you know, we had just had our team wiped out. So we know how deadly it was. And uh, we, fortunately, we had a good one zero, Spider Parks, that trained everybody up. And I knew I had to earn their respect. That was just a mutual reciprocity factor that's ingrained in all of us when you go through training group. Same with you, Greg, about with the indigenous learning not only to win the war, but the hearts and minds of the people around you, because you've moved to a lot of different countries during the global war on terror. Yeah, it was, we were always renting and they were always permanent occupants, right? Like, so there was a commitment difference there. That's uh, a good line. And, and they, they would just tell us that, like, hey, we know you're only going to be here for one deployment or six months or whatever it happens to be. So the implications of what you do, and they, they wouldn't articulate it quite this way, but the implications of what we did would affect them for much, much longer. So we would try to push these high op tempo things. We'd want to do a lot of missions. We'd want to go out and uh, integrate with a lot of different sub communities. Um, and they were, in many ways, it felt like they were slowing us down, and it can, but then when you counter that with the understanding that they're, this is where they live, it changes your perspective on it, and it helps you take more of a long-term perspective on it. And I think that that ultimately is the most beneficial way to go about it. So that's where I think that it's very similar, frankly. Like, you have to earn their respect. You have to show them that you're competent and that you actually care about them before they're ever going to be invested enough to go out and do missions with you. I know in Africa, when we were working with some of the Kenyans, they'd have a lot of vehicle issues. They had to know that we knew the mobility stuff and had the recovery gear to help them uh, and weren't just going to leave them in a firefight. You know, and it takes time to build that trust and that kind of credibility. Well, and to that point, though, when you say it takes time to build, compared to you when you're over there for an extended period of time, same country working the, the same missions, uh, you are changing up your mission set and you're bouncing around uh, six months here, six months there. You don't have a long amount of time to build that up. So I want to kind of compare those two. You have a long time to spend and get very close and you're still very close with a lot of those people. Is it the same for you having that short term to build that relationship up? I think it makes it tough, but that's where I just I love SF so much as an organization because we are ingrained to be health like comp or competitive in a very healthy way and not a cutthroat way. So like the SF team that came before us, they set us up with missions, they set us up with relationships, and then we try to do the exact same thing. So like that last week of our deployment, whenever you're doing that ripto and you had that other team in country with you, you would go introduce them to the president of this area or hey this tribal leader. Um, and so that way, and you'd already have missions planned for them. They'd be doing all their internal planning, but you'd you'd have everything set up and coordinated. So that way they can come in and. There's no slowdown in op tempo. That's, the, in my opinion, probably the best way to go about achieving that. But it does make it tough to really build those like long-term commitments or those long-term relationships, to your point. Tilt? Yeah, and for six months, I mean, that's even tougher because in our case, 
We had June and July. Those were the first two months where, in your case, you would have been one-third of your tour done. Yeah. And we did local ambushes in country, which was not a big deal. And then we finally started having a couple of missions in August, three months later. And um, even in my case, a year felt short when you talk about in terms of the relationship because um, – was a Sal, in my case, was October of uh, 68, after that mission in Echo 4, where he gave him that nod. And it's like, hey, we, we got out. And it's like, you done good. But Sal, first time he said something positive, you know. I mean, we worked together all the time. <laughs> right. but, but I mean, in, in, in the context. It was good to get yeah. physical confirmation. There we go, yeah. yeah. <laughs> after, after combat. Right. So that made it different. But. I felt guilty for the year because when you and the, our tour duty came up at the end of the year, it was like my first tour was easier because um, Lynn Black was there to take over the team. The Frenchman was on the team, and that transition that he's talking about was just a natural flow. We had run, Lynn had run several missions with us, and the Frenchman was newer to the team, but all of our indigs knew him because he's on RT Virginia beforehand. And so our both of our local teams that talked to each other, knew each other, knew their families, their wives, their stories. And so when I left, it was less painful. But still, a year, you still feel that, ah, guilty leaving, because you know they're staying there. Right. And then after my second tour of duty, leaving was the worst. Just well, carried that guilt for a long okay, time. Okay, so let's talk about that real quick, because I want to talk to <clears> you about that also. That guilt of that second tour, what made the second tour, I won't say so different, because you felt that guilt the first time. Right. But after having that second tour, what made you feel so guilty about it? You had done your time. You had spent much you know, bloodshed, tears, everything over there. And with you, Greg, when Tilt's done... Was it the same for you, feeling that guilt as you leave and you see other teams take over? Well, for my second tour, the difference was we had I had a, a young 1-1 one, one assistant team leader, John Engels. And I wasn't sure if he if he wanted to be the 1-0 or not. And I knew that uh, he'd been on the team for three months. We had a, a couple really hairy missions together. He proved himself in the field. I wasn't worried about him tactically. But, you know, sometimes people don't want to be 1-0, like the Frenchman. He says, I don't ever want to be a 1-0. I'll run recon until I die. So there are some people that didn't want that responsibility. So in my case, I wasn't sure, and my tour of duty ended suddenly because of my commanding officer. And so instead of having a really good transition from the first tour, I came into camp after we had a major disagreement. He says, you're leaving tomorrow morning at first light. So we had a team going away party, and everybody got drunk. They all passed out one by one. The last one that was awake was Hep, my interpreter. And he. we all had drank too much, of course. And Hep goes, my, do you need anything else? I said, no. And we're outside. He literally was sitting on the steps. And he rolled over and passed out on the step. <laughs> so I had to pick him up, dust him off, and put him in the bed. And I was standing there like, oh, my God. I'm, well, I'm leaving tomorrow morning, and these guys are here for the duration. And, you know, the Vietnamization was in place. They were beginning to downscale the U.S. involvement. And it's like, what is the future for them? And so I was near the end of my enlistment, and I knew I was going to go home. A, I felt guilty about that. So it's more of a personal level, nothing to do with the training side. It's just on a personal level, knowing these guys. And I was alive after 19 months of running missions with them, thanks to them and all our air support. Only by the grace of God, you know. Absolutely. Greg? I think it's situationally dependent, at least for me. Afghanistan, yeah, I, I have worse feelings about those relationships just because of the way things turned out, especially the way that we left Afghanistan. That was more than unfortunate, frankly. Uh, in Africa, I feel like we helped those guys move the football down the field, and I feel like they're doing better after we have, even after we have left. And I think they're on that that positive trajectory. And so I, I don't feel bad about those relationships. I actually feel it's very rewarding to feel that way. Uh, that we were able to be value added ultimately. So no, I don't have, it just might be different based off of the situation, frankly. I don't well, know. also you hope to work yourself out of a job. Absolutely. To get Absolutely. the locals trained up to the point where someday they won't need you. Right. And that's the ultimate goal is to say, you know, whether it takes five or 10 years, you take time, you work with them. So someday you can say, leave or dirt you, we're gone. And you can do your own. And if we still maintain a relationship, 
but not necessarily have to be there in the trenches with them because they're trained up. But yeah. the thing about you, Till, you know, when you're working, and we've kind of touched on it during this conversation, is you're running across the fence. So you're working with South Vietnamese, but you're working in other countries that aren't necessarily their home country, but it's definitely feeding the cause in their own country. Is it different? Is it a different feeling working in these other countries to protect a country and working in the country that you're actually trying to protect? Well, we knew, <clears throat> we knew the certain, they, they understood what we were doing. So they knew that it had nothing to do with Laotian independence or anything like that. We were there fighting the communists that wanted to overtake South Vietnam. And that was our effort at being at the tip of the spear to go find out what they're doing and to do the wiretaps, POW snatches, things like that. So it was always dedication to the mission and they understood that crystal clear. And we had on our team, we had three uh, men who had grown up, they were born in North Vietnam, they came south, and they would rather die fighting communism in South Vietnam than live under the communist dictatorship of Ho Chi Minh or any other asshole. Greg? I think that at least in today's environment, like with the, the terrorist activity and the terrorist organizations, it's almost universally fought against. So like, I always saw that as very, that everybody's been very supportive as much as they can be. Um, in Afghanistan, the trouble is when you're so closely you're living in such a close environment that those people are torn between both sides. If they get to show preference to one, then they get ostracized by the other. And so they're walking this fine line of trying to keep both off of their back, ultimately. In Africa, they were ab absolutely against, like the local population was absolutely against any terrorist organization that was in the area. Even if they did seem legitimate, even if they did have some influence, as long as they didn't have control, they were wanting that to go away. So uh, I always saw a lot of support depending on the situation. It was just, I feel like the everyday person is walking, they just don't want to be messed with. They want to live their own life. They want to have their family. They, they want to exist like we do here in America on a daily-to-day -day basis. And they're, they're constantly worried about, hey, these guys might come home and tear through my house looking for bad stuff. Or on the flip side, I might have other guys come in and threaten my family because they saw me and thinking that I was giving information to these guys in uniforms. So it's just a tough situation, ultimately. Same kind of problems in Vietnam with you? Well, we didn't have that with our teams. They were very discreet with their families that were living in the local village or in Da Nang. But where our traditional A teams had all kinds of stories like that. I mean, uh, stories of our medics going out and working with the people in the village, uh, building rapport, and the Viet Cong would come in and just kill families, you know, indiscriminately. And that would be, they send a message, don't work with the Americans. And it just sounds like stuff that the Hitler and his, his troops would do to any enemies to the Germans during World War II. You come in and kill innocent villagers to make a point. And um, so we didn't see that from a personal level. <clears throat> they were concerned about the Viet Cong and sympathizers, but they were very careful with their families. So we never had any issues that surfaced that we would ever heard of. But the A-team uh, A SF men had situations for sure. I want to talk about the similarities and kind of the differences between Afghanistan and Vietnam because I think, Greg, you and I have talked uh, about it. I think there's a lot of similarities between the two. Not only the kind of unconventional fighting that had to be done, but also uh, exit strategies, people in political offices that weren't on the ground making decisions. And I want to start with you about, <laughs> about Vietnam and talking about exit strategies, people making decisions that had no idea what was going on. And then, Greg, I think you feel kind of the same about Afghanistan. So, Tilt? Well, there's been books written about the ineptitude of the uh, both the Kennedy and the Johnson, and even later the Nixon administrations in terms of execution of the war. Had they approached that war the way they did World War II, I think there would have been a dramatically different outcome. And, of course, the um, ridiculous political scenarios Instead of fighting to win, you know, giving Cambodia and Laos carte blanche, and the NVA would muster, put together, Cambodia had 100,000 before Tet, and then in the North and Laos, when we arrived in, in 68, there were 25,000, at least 25,000 troops. By 70, there was 45 to 50,000. 
That included two battalions that were trained up sappers. Their sole mission was to track a recon team, kill the Americans and leave the indigenous alive for PSYOPs. And so with that going on, and then my most ridiculous situation on, on a Thanksgiving Day, we had a mission, had contact when we left, threw a white phosphorus grenade on some commies that were shooting at us <laughs> in the helicopter. I think you need to set this up, though, and tell w- w- why this story is so important about the white <laughs> phosphorus. I think you need to set that up. <laughs> well, um, I was just trying to take a shortcut to get to the politics. <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> let's, uh, let's talk about, because I think it ties into the, the politics and what we're talking about very, very much so. Well, we had, we had gone TDY to FOB6 at Honuk Tail, and uh, our first mission was we have three NVA divisions that are missing in action, the first, the third, and the seventh. So I, we briefed that night. The CO was there. S3 was there. Had intel reports. Well, the good news is the next day on Thanksgiving Day, after a nice Thanksgiving dinner, we went in. We found at least two of the three divisions, and we barely got out alive. We literally, the recon guides just smiled on us. We literally walked into a base camp. Fires were lit. Smoke was still coming up. And the point element of the new division chased us, and the tail element from the other division chased us back to the LZ with a running gun battle, claymores with five-second fuses. And we get to the LZ, the Green Hornets came in and pulled us out under extreme fire. And as we're leaving, well, we had a briefing. Don't use white phosphorus grenades. Because of politics because again. Because of politics. So, and we had no TAC air in Cambodia. The, and fortunately, we had the uh, we had very good gun crews. In this case, it was the Green Hornets from the Air Force uh, 20th Special Operations Squadron. So they're pulling us out and go, "Fuck you!" <laughs> you <know? laughs> and they, they were all, all these guys were just trying to kill us. So it's like, okay, this is payback. We left. Two days later, we inserted it to a target. I think it was Highway 31 in Cambodia. Bubba Shore had put a perfect mine in a, in this road, the highway. The communists had gone by. It had thick jungle, which put a camera out taking pictures of these guys. And it had the ambush set up. The mine was in. And we got a to call, clear frequency. General Abrams orders you return to base now. Cease and desist. Whatever you're doing, you'll be picked up. Give us an LZ. So instead of doing the commas thing, we said, I can't hear you now. Blow up a truck and get a POW. Um, we pulled back the ambush, went back to base. And we learned that Premier Sinuk had filed a formal protest about my white phosphorus grenade. <laughs> and they the pulled the out Premier of, the of Cambodia. Yeah, the Premier yeah. of Cambodia. And he wasn't concerned about the 100,000 commies that were hanging out there from North Vietnam. So that's the epitome of uh, the ridiculous political situations uh, that we were up against. And, and what was your excuse why the white phosphorus came out? Well, the CO was pretty good. Because he really wanted to know where these guys were. So now we, the good news is we found them. Right. The bad news was, you know, they chased us back to LZ. Um, so I told him, I said, well, sir, officially for the record, we had been in combat and the white phosphorus fell out and somehow it exploded <laughs> when it landed on those poor commies. I really felt bad. And then I said, he said, well, what really happened? I said, no, fuck them. They were commies trying to kill us. <laughs> he said, okay, I'll cover. <laughs> Greg, with you, uh, politics about Afghanistan, because I know you feel very strongly about Afghanistan, mm. tilt as you do about Vietnam. Let's talk a little about the politics, stuff that you saw where people are making decisions that should not be making decisions. Yeah, I mean, it's tough. I hate to put myself into a position to be judgmental because, like, the, especially the guys that I've worked with, the leadership I've had have been phenomenal. They're guys I still respect and admire to this day. But I do struggle with just simply, right, like three or four years prior to all of this, it, this was such an imperative situation that is extreme enough for us to go halfway across the world where, frankly, there are several friends of mine that will never come back from it. And then fast forward to when we're doing, we're leaving, now all of that doesn't seem to be the same. Uh, and I struggle with understanding why that changed or how that changed. Because we never got to a place, in my opinion, where Afghanistan was capable of will say, maintaining itself, at least in the way that Iraq was. So I mean, maybe it's just personal, but like that's that's what I struggle to understand and reconcile overall is uh, a few years before we were going on deployments. This was critical. We were training up. We we're putting all this effort uh, into building up Afghanistan and fighting this enemy in this location. And then all of a sudden it's like, hey, we're just going to let them have it. And that was kind of tough for me to to really understand. 
ultimately. And I do feel like, especially talking to some of my family that it, that were in Vietnam, it was similar. Um, and so that's, it's been a relatable point, ultimately. Wasn't there a common point? We compare our collapse to your collapse. They're both pathetic. Yeah. And it just... Uh, it was tough seeing those those videos of that uh, the aircraft leaving, leaving Bagram, man. Oh, yeah, the people, people same, falling off Same the kind of flashbacks to uh, Saigon. Oh, sure, yeah. April 30th, 1975. So... We're sorry, fighting Kabul, Kabul. not Bagram. Yeah, right. Here's the thing, though. We're fighting a different kind of enemy, but you're fighting the same kind of enemy. You're fighting communists. You're fighting loosely terrorists, which can conform to whatever they need to conform to at that time, which terrorism often does. You're fighting the communism and a, almost an ideology. Would you consider terrorism an ideology, too, because it's changing to what it needs to be every time it needs to change into something. I think that it's more fragmented, but I, I do think it's an, it's ideologies, maybe. Um, I think that that is what allows these groups to garner the support that they have, uh, whether it be religiously based or locally based off of tribal relationships, which you see a lot. So I do think that that is an aspect of it. It is, I, I would call it an ideology, ultimately. And don't forget today, they have TikTok. And I've talked to SF guys that said TikTok does a better job of recruiting for ISIS and the enemy forces than any, anything out there right now, today. And that's interesting that you bring that up. So let's talk a little bit about the technology from your time to them. You're right. Terrorism is now recruited online. Like, you can find someone that's never seen that side of the world, has never opened a Quran, anything like that from St. Louis, Missouri, and six months later, they're training in a group in Russia, in the Middle East. They're training with terrorism groups. Yours was very much homegrown, you would agree, or at least that area of the world, and it was more homegrown in the sense that it's face-to-face -face bringing someone, whether they wanted to or not, into the communist way of thinking. Right, and the communists had their way. I mean, in North Vietnam, you're going to serve or you're going to die right now. So they, they had their army, and they, people had to do what they were told. And so that was a straightforward communist document doctrine being implemented on the battlefield. That's why they kept resupplying. And, of course, they had the Russians and the Chinese supplying them with the supplies of weapons, anti-aircraft, all that sort of thing. But it was, it was, you're right, it was all indigenous. It was all in country, whereas today TikTok could be anybody, even Americans that have succumbed to that, propaganda to wind up fighting another American in Afghanistan or Iraq. Greg, your thoughts on it? Yeah, smartphones have changed the world, right? Um, to your point, it's just so accessible, right? It's there in your face. You don't even have to look for it, and you'll those things <clears> will <throat> pop up on Instagram, TikTok, all these social media applications. With that, though, the options you have with cell phones as far as what you, what they'll tell you, right? The accessibility of reaching people, that also changes the battlefield and how you interact with it. So it's just an interesting way that things have gone over time. But that is how people recruit now, right? Internet, cell phones. It is, and, and it's funny, the more I think about it, the more ideological I really do think that it is now. Like it isn't someone sticking a gun in your face. It is someone presenting, like you see a video and you something that resonates with you or you believe in that. And that's what motivates you to, yeah, fly halfway across the, the world and go do this crazy thing, you know? When we talk about the fighters and the difference in, like we talked about with yours, you either fight with us or you die and your family dies. Uh, recruiting is kind of free. I'm sure they do take people w without their permission to fight for them. Which do you think makes a more harsh fighter? Because you, the guys you fought were animals fighting them. Same with you. Some of those weren't there of their own free will but still fought like animals for a different reason, for fear of being killed for not fighting for the cause. Yeah, they have a good officer in the, with the Communist Party back there with a pistol. <laughs> right. Go charge, tilt, <laughs> or I'll kill you. Right. Oh, okay, well, I'll take my chances with that knucklehead from New Jersey. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so do you think that that makes them more full-hearted into the battle, or do you think that there's a lot of second-guessing going on because they're being forced to fight this battle that they may not want to fight? 
Well, there's been some good books, I'm told. I haven't read any of them yet, but I've heard of a couple of guys that have read books by North Vietnamese soldiers who talked about coming south, getting bombed, and upon reflection, learned more about the United States. And had they had the opportunity or the freedom to think about what they wanted to do with their lives, they would have done something different. And, uh, you know, again, it's just communism beating people up to do what the, what the rulers want. And it's terrifying. And it, it does it definitely makes it for, for an interesting battlefield. You know, again, we're talking propaganda here. The people are told this. They never get it. They had no internet back then. They didn't know what America, or what we were, why we were really there. You know, our special forces motto is de oppresso liber, to free the oppressed. We're not there to conquer or take your land, regardless of what Ken Burns or any of those other assholes say. Um, we were there to help fight communism. And um, the propaganda was what they heard, and they didn't know what the other part of the story was from South Vietnam. They just wanted to be left alone, and they didn't want to be communists. And the guys on my team, they would say it. Our government is corrupt in South Vietnam. We know that. But we can live with a corrupt government here. It's better than living under the communist thumb. Which is an interesting thought to, to think about, that they would rather live with a, I guess, the lesser of two evils. A known or the, entity. Pick your poison, yeah. yeah. You know, it could be the guy that beat you up or the guy that can't keep the lights on and beat you up. You know, it could be, <laughs> it could be worse always. Same with you, Greg, about those thoughts. I think you would struggle to use that tactic in today's environment because of the, the accessibility of information, right? Like it's, you can't control the propaganda as much as I think you were uh, in that time period because people do have access to all this stuff on their phone, right? Like even in third world countries, <clears throat> people may not have running water or like consistent electricity, but they have a cell phone with signal and they'll charge their phone to a certain spot for two hours a day and they'll have that. They'll be doing, they'll be using Twitter, they'll be using Facebook. It's, it's a very interesting world that we live in just uh, in this time frame. But I don't think you'd get away with that, like on a large scale, just threatening people to be a part of this organization, because I think that the information is out there, it's pervasive that they have other options, ultimately, and how to do it, right? Via the internet, via Facebook, and all these other different uh, mediums, they can reach out to people that can help them get into another country or get out Much of their situation. Much more sophisticated propaganda. It has to be, yeah. yeah. That's what it is, no matter how you cut it. I mean, I'm biased. <laughs> yeah, I think you're right. I, and I think yeah. that it's more ideologically based, right? Sure. Like you're trying to convince people instead of force people necessarily. So there's maybe less coercion. I don't know. Yeah, indeed. But well, they, they well let's, yeah, let's talk about that. The similarities and the differences, because in Vietnam, psychological operations were huge. PSYOPs is still a very important cause in the special operations world. But like you said, it's a different world now with those psychological operations and how they're performing them. What did you see in Vietnam and in the secret war, per se, for psychological operations? Well, the most brutal would be, like I mentioned earlier, how when they trained up their sapper teams, they were told to go in and kill the Americans on the, on the recon team and leave the indigenous people alive. That's the epitome of psyops on the battlefield. The idea being that that would cause a great concern and um, even doubt within the ranks. And after you know, we'd, we've been told about it, briefed on it before missions, and until you see it happen where we lost teams like that, then you just have, you realize what the impact is. And teams that weren't, or new teams that were just forming up that may have caused derision within the team. But again, my team, we sat down and talked about it and said, look, this is what happened. If you hear anything, tell me. And our team was always cohesive on that. And uh, even to the point where when we moved to Da Nang from Fubai in, in January of 69, we went down there, we had our team meeting when we arrived, and we told them, don't forget August 23rd, 1968, when Da Nang was hit, we lost 16 Green Berets that night in one attack, a sapper attack. And um, we said, if you hear anything, and please go find out. If you know anything about any Viet Cong here or that you feel they're suspicious, let me know or how we should deal with it. They said, we'll take care of it. We'll find out. So if there is ever an attack, we'll know who they are and we'll take care of them. And they talked to some of the other teams like Virginia and Michigan, those RTs that we knew from FOB1 that moved south, the little people were talking to each other. And so that's the way they worked together to deal with that. 
Greg? I think it was very similar, frankly. We were talking about targeting in PSYOPs. I always thought initially like PSYOPs is pamphlet drops and that type of thing. That's that's really what I was exposed to. Which really, and that's how it did start. I mean, in earlier well, wars where you're dropping pamphlets from aviation coming over. I mean, Well, you also had, I mean, from the time that the North Vietnamese defeated the French in May of 54 at the Bien Phu, they were moving south already to take over the South because it had been delineated at the DMZ. And they had people coming south. They had their propaganda. They had people in the local villages that were moving forward with those efforts. And that had been going on for years before we got involved. And those efforts just kicked up. So those were behind the scene. And they were very political and they were savvy about it. I don't think, I don't know if we ever really caught up to combating other than maybe through the Phoenix Project and a couple other things that was designed to go after the infrastructure of the Viet Cong in the local villages, find them, capture them, interrogate them, and get, remove them from the battlefield one way or another. I, and I think those things uh, are impactful, but I wonder how, I don't think they're as powerful as the, the example you're presenting, right? Like when you're actually targeting American forces and leaving the partner force, I, and that still happens to, to this day. We experienced that in Africa, frankly. But I think that though it's more action-based, like the more powerful psychological warfare mechanisms are, are action-based uh, more than they are just necessarily a pamphlet or a, a post on social media or something to that extent. And I got, and that maybe isn't something I've really been exposed to as much. I know we had a MISO unit or a PSYOPs unit working with us uh, whenever we would deploy, but um, that was never the, like, the focus of what we were doing. Like it was much more action-focused, admittedly. And we did a lot we'll say by, with, and through our partner force. Um, that was probably the most effective way we found to impact the, you know, the environment and the, the people in the area. And maybe even to some extent, it's some of the stuff we did that I found actually genuinely rewarding as far as doing uh, med caps or medical capabilities uh, operations where you would open up, like you'd have a small clinic and you would invite the local population to come out. Like you teach personal hygiene, you would help them with lo- like just basic medical stuff. That in and of itself is arguably a, a psychological operation because you're trying to, as you put it, win the hearts and minds, like build that, that like genuine support and show that you are, you know, committed to the local population and the betterment of the community as a whole. Did you find that that worked? I don't know how you would define success necessarily on that, but I do think that that helped. I think that that helped us to build the kind of operational success that we saw because in, at least with what we've done in kind of Afghanistan in the modern era, the civcast and civilian casualties is a very significant concern. And so I think that that helps with those situations because there'll be a lot of false reporting, right? The enemy knows that that's an issue. So if they, they know that if they can say, oh, well, they weren't bad guys, they were actually, you know, my uncle or my brother and you just killed them for no reason, it helps when the local population can come back and be like, nope, those are actually bad guys. If they can confirm that on your behalf and they have no real incentive to do so, that's a big help. And I think the way you build that that situation is by showing them that you do care, like that you're, that you're genuine and that you're, that you're there to support that community. So I think in that regard, it did help. Yeah, those med caps were amazing. Cause we even had them at, at, at our FOB1. They would have local people from the local village come in or team members with family members that had illnesses, pregnancies, VD, whatever it was, they would come in and they'd work on it, you know? <laughs> <laughs> help patch them up. <laughs> <laughs> All right. You've talked a lot about intelligence and clubhouse intelligence. And that was, I think, in listening to you and everyone that you <clears throat> talked to, was probably the most important aspect of your job in the secret war was intelligence. And everything was intelligence driven. You even have said that sometimes you went in and it was scary because you had no intelligence for what was going on and built it while you were there. I want to talk to you both about intelligence, how it was driven, and we know that it's important, but let's talk about how important it was and not only learning the intelligence of the area, but the indigenous intelligence of the area. Well, from our side, um, we never had enough. And even the stuff you got back for the agencies, you know, you didn't know if it was reliable or not. And things change so quickly. And I think there's been so many cases of, but like the attack on August 23rd, 68 in Da Nang, there had been some reports about it, but it never got up to the command level to make a decision to fortify the camp or to alert everybody. Be on an extra alert because we could get hit. So that's a, like a very graphic example 
of an Intel failure. The guys were there. Some people heard about it. They would go to the command, but nobody would react. That's just a, uh, in our case, locally at Fubai, and then later we went to Da Nang. If there's anything immediate, our little people would hear about it, but that's just local stuff. In terms of the bigger picture, we would hear from other team members or for some of our guys would go to Saigon for reports. They would hear things there and come back and tell us. Uh, I felt we never had a really accurate picture of what was going on. That's why we were going out in the first place, was to obtain any intel, either through wiretaps, POW snatches, or just trail observations to be able to alert when a major unit or tanks were heading towards uh, Vietnam. I think that's a good point. It's like, what level are you talking? The S2 is going to have a lot of their information on a, a maybe a larger scale or a broader scale, but it's you asked the question earlier about indigenous relationships and how that benefits you, and that's one. And it can be critical, right? It's like it's funny in Texas trying to get from here to the, or from the hotel to the studio, I can pull up GPS. There are streets with the name on them. They're all paved. There's street lights. There are rules, right? Where you go in the world, it, it isn't necessarily like that. You might find yourself in a place where there's the road doesn't have a name. There are no street lights. It's actually eight to 12 different dirt paths that cross each other. There are trees in the way. They all seem to be going the same general direction. <laughs> but having somebody that's lived there their whole life, they can say, oh, no, this is how you get to this place. At least we know the name of the place we're going. All right, cool. Well, I can get you there. All right. Um, and you do all your own map checks and you're using GPS to track it as well. But that can be a huge benefit, especially if you're in a IED infested environment, you know. So it depends on what level, frankly. The S2 isn't going to have that that kind of clarity. The other SF teams might. That's well, where we're that biased group. too. We always want it to be better. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Tell us what's really going on. Maybe we don't have to go on this mission after all. You got a good intel report here. Well, and and when you bring up that of being better and stuff, I, I think overall the teams that are there are better than anything that was ever expected, not only in Vietnam, but in, in Afghanistan and Iraq and Africa when we went over there. I think that there was a high level of what people expected us to bring, and we far exceeded that in everything that we did, every mission that we did, intelligence that we brought out, and just stuff that we brought to the surface that no one even knew about, especially the secret war that no one knew about for years because of the NDAs. The last thing I kind of want to talk about with this is you mentioned it uh, being a heavily IED'd area, having the intelligence to get around it. Yours wasn't necessarily IEDs. It was booby traps, punji sticks, things like that. But it was very heavily used over there by the North Vietnamese. I want to kind of compare booby traps and really attacking the psychological base of American soldiers, not indigenous personnel, but American soldiers with the kind of booby traps, with the kind of stuff that they set up in order to inflict that mental harm on the soldiers? Well, again, in my experience, going across the fence, we didn't worry about that. We, did, we never had, never encountered too much. We, had, we did in the Ashall Valley come across punji pits, but one time was after the monsoon season, or right at the end of the monsoon season, and a lot of punji pits were all exposed. And so we just stayed away from it. In fact, uh, we were moving one time, and the 1-1 one slipped and started to fall. I just grabbed him by the backpack and says, I'm not ready to be 1-1 one -one yet. Get back. <laughs> but on a local level, at, again, at Da Nang, at FOB4 or at CCN later, we had to walk up to Marble Mountain. And the Marble Mountain was right next to the base, and we walked up, the, there was a couple different trails. Well, we had come off early in the morning, went down, showered and shaved, got resupplied, and somehow a helicopter wasn't available. They always made us march back up. When we were back up, Sal was training Hung how to be a point man. And that day, they went across approximately a dozen separate ambush things that had set up, not ambushes, but the booby traps, claymores, toe poppers, hand grenades with the trip wires on them. And it took us several hours to get up to that mountain that day because the Viet Cong had come in when we were down at the bottom and they put all that shit in. Now, that had, been, had that been me running point, I wouldn't be here. I'd be fertilizer on Marble Mountain. But the Indids saw it. So that would, so those booby traps were there. And again, when you're on Highway 1 just driving in country, you're always worried about getting ambushed. That was always a constant, but nothing like what these guys put up with, with the IEDs. 
Well, I want to talk real quick before we get into the IEDs with you. Uh, you said you came down, and by the time you came back up, they had already set up 12 emplacements. How does that affect the team mentally going, we just fucking cleared this area when we came down here, and now we're clearing it going back up, and we'll probably clear it when we come back down and go back up again. Does that ever get into the psyche and go, shit, it's almost overwhelming like a wave where they just never seem to take a break? Well, and again, they they wouldn't do it every day. They would do it when they wanted to. So they would depend on human nature getting lazy or careless. So fortunately that day, Sal was training Hung and he had a great training session. He became a good point man after that. (laughs) Yeah, most definitely. With the IEDs, we hear differently. It wasn't a day-by-day basis when they decided. It was all the time. That was, yeah, the most frequent way, or at least one of the the most frequent ways that guys would get killed in Afghanistan. At least in our area, this is when I was in the infantry, it was uh, pressure plate IEDs throughout the area. Um, when, when we came, they were using uh, things made out of metal, so you could use different detectors. So we would carry enablers with us, uh, mine detectors, that type of thing, ground penetrating radar, those things. And that would help, but it was still it did have a, like a very significant psychological impact when that stuff would happen. Um, and they keep getting better, right? It's funny, you can think about these different con- countries and they may not have the education and the, the training that we necessarily do, but they're still very intelligent and cunning. And so like, they realized that if they put it in the ground on a, a trail that we would be looking for with our enablers, and that's where we would scan. But we weren't scanning because where we were, the way they would irrigate was they would dig these troughs along their fields, and then they would flood them with water to uh, hydrate all their plants. And then alongside of that, they would build a little uh, wall, a dirt wall. Well, they would just dig underneath at an angle, looking like they were just irrigating their fields, and they'd place an IED at a 45-degree angle out there. So when you're scanning, you don't see it. Uh, you don't pick it up. Uh, they were also using no, no metallics. They would use chemical initiators. So, yeah, that definitely has a psychological impact. But I also think you kind of come to this point where you're, you're almost accepting of it, right? Like, this is why you came here to do this. Like, you joined the military to do something like this. And so you, you accepted risk on so many other levels that it's just another aspect of that. The most impactful times, I know I talked about it last time I was on here, was when Something happens and it's uh, one of the guys in your unit, you know what I mean? And having to witness that and help them through that, trying to help them to survive if they do, that is where it has the most significant like impact. And it can take guys a long time to truly recover and be able to be operationally effective after that. With everything that you guys saw in Vietnam, in Afghanistan, in Africa, is there anything that sticks out from your service over there that was either – you know, that you'll never forget it. If you if you have a smell, if you smell something, the memory comes back to you. If you see a, a certain, I don't know, something that makes that memory pop up, is there anything that stands out to you? <laughs> well, there's a few. JP4. Okay. <laughs> you know, that's the first one. Because whenever you're at an airport, you smell that stuff. Absolutely. It's like, we're back in denying here again at the airbase, you know. Or the king bees are coming in. Sometimes with the heat, if you're around your horses and you get the horse manure going, then you think about the, uh, we used to do some uh, training around the rice paddies just to go out for the local presence. That always comes back. Very pungent memory. <laughs> but that's basically the long and the short of it. Of course, whenever you hear aircraft, I mean, to this day, we still hear all the C-130s. I live in Tennessee. So the, uh, we hear the 130s all the time, or now the, the Blackhawks at night. So I still hear a helicopter coming before anybody else. Anything, have you ever had any adverse, uh, when you hear that and that memory comes back, anything adverse or does it take you back into the moment at the time or is it has it been enough time where no, it's, it's just, just like, a memory? Yeah, it's just a memory. It puts me in that place and time. And, uh, you know, there are cases when I hear some songs or something like this, we'll think about some of the team members. The indig, you know, because one of our one of our guys, Chow, was learning how to play the guitar, and so during our second tour, they forced us to do isolation before a mission, which I felt insulted my local people, but we did it, and so Chow, he was learning how to play these Beatles songs like um, "I Want You," "I Want You So Bad," <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and here he is, just Chow singing the Beatles song, and this is right after the White Album came out, you know. 
Number nine, number nine. He got that line down really good. <laughs> <laughs> Anything with you, Greg? It's like, it's like burnt trash for every reason. Like the smell of burning trash, some food smells, like ethnic food. It's the same. It, it's not. It's a compelling memory. It's not like a, a flashback or anything. It just kind of brings me back to uh, a certain time and place, ultimately. I want to finish up with you guys just kind of saying your thoughts about how you think that the generations have come up after Special Forces, well, your we generation. Do that, we got to talk about their equipment. I would okay. Have run, I would have uh, run absolutely. Over, I would have run over your mother to get one of his nogs. <laughs> <laughs> Let's talk about it then, the equipment. Uh, oh, yeah, great stuff. Yeah, it's a blessing and a curse though, right? Because, yeah, you've got all this great equipment, but it isn't light, right? And you got to carry it all. And then that becomes an, a, a requirement, right? You got to have the batteries. Yeah, yeah, you do. Um, and they all take different types of, well, not all of them, but some of them take different types of batteries and it sure. takes different types of training. I mean, I, I wouldn't want it any other way, but yeah, it's, it's a burden unto itself. And then you got to train on all of it. Like we were talking about uh, IEDs and how to, how to find those. I still remember when I was in Afghanistan, the 18 Bravo on 3314 that taught me how to look for trip wires and uh, IEDs with under nods with a laser. Like really? if you're, if, if, as you're, yeah, as you're shining your laser, if you see it flicker, there's something that's breaking that beam. So, yeah, it, it's a great benefit, but you got to learn how to use it. You know what I mean? And that takes a lot of training and you only have so much time before you go out and hit that hit that target or go on that deployment. But no, it's definitely a benefit. Yeah, well, thanks to our technicians. I mean, they had the nog, they owned the night, whereas most of us stopped at night. We did have the uh, starlight scopes that came out, very primitive, very heavy, and they ruined your night vision. And we only used those on local ambushes because of the weight. Never took them to the field. Now, there, there have been a couple of teams, I think, that did take them, I forget what the results were. I don't want to speak on their behalf, but nothing like what you all had. So I always kind of, when those nogs first came out, because we had relationships with some of the SF guys, they talk about it. And then you put those nogs on today, oh my God, that would have been great. <laughs> I just those. can't believe you'd run over my mother to get the nods. But uh, <laughs> I, let's talk about that real quick then, equipment. Sure. Uh, let's talk about loadouts, because you've told me about some of your loadouts where you're carrying an ungodly amount of gear. Of course, you did too, but I think they're separate kinds of loadouts. I think they're different kinds of loadouts for the different kinds of warfare that we were doing, although it's the same, it's very different. So let's talk about a typical loadout for you and a typical loadout for you. Yeah, so I always carried the PRIC-25, which, which was our initial combo, uh, FM radio. So that's our link to, to all the air assets. And so I always had that with a battery then 600 plus rounds for my car 15, then 10 to 12 rounds for the, we always carried, saw, all the Americans carried sawed off M79s for extra firepower, and then 10 to 12 hand grenades, smoke grenades, and then a little food, maybe water, depending on how much water was in the AO, and um, a sweater, and then of course we had the mirror, morphine, surrettes, a, a knife, we always had to take a gas mask because they had used gas, on some of our teams. And of course, uh, we trained to use them so that in the worst scenario, we would yell smoke or for gas and everybody try to get their gas mask on in the middle of a firefight to pop the CS because that causes great disorientation amongst the enemy. <clears throat> and the classic example, that was Operation Tailwind, which was in Laos, a four-day operation on a contoon. And when the last helicopter came in to pull out the remaining Green Berets and their indigenous troops, they made gun runs with Sky Raiders with CS gas. And it disoriented the North Vietnamese enough that the troops could get on the CH-53 Delta and leave. And they, came, they got, got heavy weapons fire on the way out, but they got out. So um, that's, that's the long and short of it. What do you think was your weight of your typical loadout? We had a cheap little scale. One day I stepped on it with and without the web gear. I think it was around 85 or 90 pounds. Okay. Greg, with you, loadout? So I would have a plate carrier, front, back, side plates. Um, I would carry about seven or eight M4 mags, M4 suppressed, uh, Glock 19 with probably 30 three. 30 round mags. 30 round, yeah. Yeah, yeah. a few more rounds. <laughs> Less mag changes. Indeed. <laughs> yeah. Another had... benefit that I admire. We would have died for one of those. <laughs> yeah. 
I'm definitely not complaining. Yeah. 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 Uh, so yeah, those are uh, those are weapons. Oh, I used to carry a grenade launcher too on slung on my back for marking and for uh, indirect. Two radios. I had to listen to one in each ear uh, through Peltor's talk higher and talk on the team. Uh, helmet nods. Nice thing with the radio, instead of having to go back and change it, there's a little display unit that I used to keep up here. There's remote, so I'd run that cable up. And then a few uh, frag grenades is what I would carry on my person. And then my bag, I'd have extra mags, food, water, and just any other things that we would need for marking. I'm usually a VS-17 panel, uh, American flag, just for memorabilia, so to speak. And that would be, a lot of stuff we would do would be from vehicles, just up armored. So especially when you're in an IED environment, the MRAPs were a great tool to have, just greatly improved survivability. So you would be able to rely on some of that, uh, depending on the situation. But just for a day pack, that's what I would throw in there. Tourniquets, med kit, that was always on your person and marked. So we do the training, the, yeah, the Tri-C training on that. But uh, yeah, that was my general pack. I think that probably your plate carry and all that's probably at least 45 pounds plus a bag, which is probably another 30 to 45, maybe 90 pounds. So tradition, pretty close to the same. All right. Now, before we got into the equipment talk, what so, I was going to say, no, no, no. I'm, I'm glad that you brought it up because I think it's a good point to bring up. Let's talk about one, you, how you think that the Green Beret has uh, evolved and what they have become. And then for you, Greg, I want to talk about standing on these guys' shoulders of everyone that came before you, the stories that you've heard, the legends that have come out of there. And... Quite frankly, there's legends today, but this is the basis of the Green Beret movie and what people think about the book and all that kind of stuff comes from you guys. So you talk about how they've evolved and what you think is so great about them now. And then, Greg, the opposite for you, what you stand on their shoulders for and why you think that their generation was so great. Well, in my case, we were familiar with the OSS and the Jedberg teams. So they had the Jedberg teams. We knew, knew about but didn't hear any definitive history for Korean spec ops. And then we had the SF originals that were formed in 52. So that's the beginning of special forces. So we always looked up to them. And in my case, Roger Donlan, he earned the Medal of Honor in 64. And uh, seeing him, always wanted to, to emulate what he had done. So in my mind, I always felt like we tried to improve what they had done. We stood, we stood on their shoulders and the different generations of SF have stood on our shoulders and they've raised the bar, people like Greg. And in, in the last five months, I've been to a third, fifth, and seventh Special Forces group, MARSOC, and have talked to some SEALs, young SEALs. And these kids are amazing. And they are standing on our shoulders and they're moving the bar f forward with um, the best way they can. And uh, They're sharper, they got better equipment by far. And... Um, of course, their commanding officers are more risk averse than ours back in that day, but there's a different threshold back then than today. But I felt as though I stood on their shoulders and today's generations have stepped forward to improve what we did. Greg? Yeah, I mean, I'm just very grateful for everything you guys have done. Uh, I know we were talking a little bit before the podcast. I hope my generation has been as explicit about it as I, I th I'd like to think that we, well, that we would strive to be. But even like my uncle was in Vietnam and I talked to him about coming home and not having the support structure that exists now. That's so critical in just the experience, right? I hope that we are living up to the standards you guys have set. I still remember reading SOG while I was in the Q course and just hearing these stories. And it's just so impressive that it seems insurmountable. I don't think that... I don't think I will ever reach that that level, that pinnacle of, of success. But at the same time, I'm just so proud to be a part of it and honored to even be here talking with you, Tilt. Um, so I hope that we've expressed That's that. Mutual. Oh, thank you, sir. Absolutely. But it just gratitude isn't doesn't capture it. I'm just so thankful and grateful for everything that you guys have done and set us up for success in the long run. The culture probably is the most important thing. That was one of the things I love so much about SF. It was just bottom-up driven. It was NCO driven. And that came from what you guys did in, in Vietnam. That came from the Jedberg teams in World War II. And we still strive to, to embody that today. But it's truly an honor, sir. Well, that's mutual because these young men that I've talked to, SF are the quiet professionals, and that's really a pain in the ass. Because <laughs> when I go to third group and fifth group and talk to these guys, well, how many tours of duty did you have? 
Well, I had uh, 11 or 13. I can't remember. What? I had two. I was just amazed that I survived that. And these guys are pulling 11, 12, 13, and some people that are close to 20 tours of duty. And that's just mind-boggling. And everybody's so humble about it. But, like, as he's talking about how they made their adjustments in their different AOs, wherever SF goes, that's the way you have to do is adapt, learn, try to improve the mission, and get it accomplished. And that's, these young men do it. And it's amazing, their stories. But they're so humble, we can't get them to talk about it. But, of course, in some cases, they can. We've been over to CAG or to Delta Force, and it's like, Remember the day? And these guys are talking back and forth. I'll hear them talk and say, hey, tell me about this. Well, we can't right now. <laughs> uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I think you better than anyone would know that, signing the oh, NDAs yeah, that you sure. did. <laughs> so in, in kind of closing, is there anything that you guys would like as a final thought, a final note to people that are listening, guys that may be coming into this field or are already there and kind of growing into another field? Well, uh, I, I think it's safe to say that our country has never – been in more need of spec ops people that uh, uh, love our country and are willing to go to bat for it, step up to the plate, than right now, except maybe since World War II, when we had a lot of uh, evil forces. But now our country is under attack again. It's a different kind of warfare. And uh, we need good spec ops more than ever. And um, in my case, I was just lucky. I always felt lucky to get in, to get through the qualifications, to make it. And then once we got to Vietnam, it was to do the best I could. <clears throat> and that that mentality is reflected by all the SF men today. And even the, the young men from Air Force, Spec Ops, the SEALs we talked to, MARSOC, these kids are sharp, and they really want to do what's right. So it's been really um, reaffirming to see these young men, in this case, some of the, some women are working into it now, getting into those Spec Ops. We need them. And... Um, just, just pray for him. Be successful. Greg, any final thoughts? Yeah, I would mirror that. That's one of the things I really like about what I do at Hatchet is I do get to feel tied into the community, and I hope that I continue to represent the, the regiment as best I can moving forward, even doing things like this. So it is a concern, but I think that it's something that we're going to figure out ultimately. It's just a generational issue, perhaps, or a short-term issue that we're working through. But no, I, I'm proud to be part of the organization or have been part of the organization. And I hope that we've just set it up for success for the next generation, much like you guys have, oh, ultimately. Yeah. Because to this day, every man I meet, I judge compared to the men I've worked with at FOB1 and the sacrifices that uh, a lot of them did. Well, I got to tell you, from my final thoughts, I'm so happy that I got to see two generations sit down and talk to each other. I think it is a, a great thing for people to see because I think a lot of people see, you know, a podcast or a story where it's this generation or it's this generation. And it's great to see how they come together and and kind of bond over that that love of their country and love of their teams. And so in closing, I just want to say thank you so much. I'm so honored. Tilt. Greg, for you both being here and being part of this. Guys, uh, that's going to be it for this week. Make sure you check me out on Instagram, DTD underscore podcast, Facebook at the DTD podcast, YouTube at the DTD podcast, and then DTD podcast.net is the one-stop shop audio and video, and we'll have this on here. Hopefully we have further conversations with both of these legends. Check us out. Make sure you subscribe. If you don't, I'm just going to keep making the videos anyway. You're going to have to listen to them one way or the other. Thank you, guys. We'll catch you on the next one. See you later. Airborne. Thanks for having us, man. All right.